So if you're like me, you might have heard of the Pfizer COVID pill and be wondering what the heck it is. Um, long story short, it is a main protease inhibitor for um, the coronavirus. Um, so basically, we often think of proteins as like individual units. So these like molecular workers in our cell, like one cell might do this, one, one protein might do this, one protein might do that, one protein might do this. Um, these like individual units. Um, so all proteins are made of long chains that fold up. Um, so these long polypeptide chains. But the with the virus, it goes a step further. And instead of just coding like one chain per protein, what it does is it codes a long chain, like a polyprotein chain. Um, so it actually has these various proteins. It makes them all as one long chain. Well, not all of them, but many of them as one long chain. And then it chops it up into individual proteins um, that then can do, and do their functioning. And the enzymes or the reaction speeder uppers um, that help chop this up um, are called proteases. And the, um, so SARS-CoV-2, um, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19, it has a couple proteases. Um, and the main protease, um, this like MPRO, sometimes called like 3CL because it's a chemotrypsin-like um, peptidase um, or protease. Is different um, names, but um, it's it's like the main one, and it makes like eleven chops. So it's really important for separating the viral proteins, and so the virus needs to separate the proteins so that those proteins can go and do their jobs, like replicate the RNA, like inhibiting the immune system from attacking it, all these various functions. So it, these need to be chopped up first, though. And so the protease is really important for doing that chopping. It needs, you need the protease to do the chopping. And if the protease can't do the chopping, then the virus can't make, it, it can't separate its proteins. Um, so it's kind of like you're tying up all the proteins of the, of the virus and then they can't do anything. So they can't replicate. Um, and so that is what this drug does. It inhibits the protease. So basically, it sticks to the scissors of those proteases blades. Um, it's what we call like a reversible covalent inhibitor. So it gets like pretty fairly stuck, but it is reversible. So it's not permanently stuck as we'll see. Um, and as for like, you might've heard that it's like in combination, it's given in combination with an HIV drug and you're like, what the heck? Um, so basically that like HIV drug is ritonavir and um, it's not really like an HIV drug. What it actually is, is it, I mean, like it was given with some HIV drugs because what it does is it inhibits this, um, it inhibits a host um, enzyme. So it inhibits like one of a human enzyme um, called um, CYP. It's a CYP enzyme or CYP. Um, so basically these are enzymes made by your liver um that help metabolize or like break down or modify um set foreign substances and even self substances or whatever and like break down processes so basically when you take a drug it goes it's gonna go like things go like straight to your liver and then your liver is like might change it modify it um such so as with these sip enzymes and so they can they can like add oh groups and stuff um and this then makes the it accelerates the clearance of the drug, so how quickly you like pee it out. Um, and so by inhibiting this CYP enzyme, you can slow the metabolism of the drug and therefore it'll last longer. And then it'll, since it's sticking around longer, it's gonna have more and more chances to inhibit the virus from replicating. And the more that you inhibit the virus from replicating, um, hopefully the better the outcome because you're not making, making more and more virus. Um, and so your, your body's going to have a better chance to fight off the virus that is actually already there. Okay. So that was the long story short, but you know that I'm not really a long story short kind of person. So let's go to the long story long. So I'm going to walk you guys through some of the, um, stuff from this paper. So this was published in Science a couple of days ago. Uh, first author, David R. Owen. Um, and so this, I'm not going to talk about any therapeutic uh, trial or stuff. This is more of a, I think they've only given a press release at this time for the clinical data, um, but this is 
more of the, the beforehand um, determining the um, like developing the compound and that sort of thing. Um, so they actually developed it based on a so they had a <clears throat> starting point was this original this um, compound that they did discovered during original research on like SARS so like the, the CoV one. Um, so I'll talk more about this table and stuff later, but it was potent, so it was highly effective, um, but it had poor bioavailability. So basically they had to give it IV. Um, and so they went through a bunch of optimization and modifying various chemical properties and groups and ended up with this compound PF07321332, um, which is what is in the, um, the drug. Um, and so it's still potent, um, marginally less, but really barely less. Um, and it has much better availability. So it can be given as an oral pill, which is really important because then people don't need to be in the hospital. They don't need to be in an infusion clinic and they can take this early on. And so you want to give it early on because it's going to inhibit um, the virus's replication. And so let's talk more about how, how this is first. Um, so you're probably really familiar over and over seeing something like this where SARS-CoV-2, it has this membrane um, envelope and then inside it has this single strand of RNA with all the instructions for making everything the virus will need. Um, then in this membrane, there's some things including this spike protein, which is going to latch onto cells and let, this, um, let the cells in. And so basically in terms of strategies for trying to prevent this. Um, so basically the, now it, it's um, believed that the, most of the entry actually happens at the surface, but it can also um, come in via like being pinched in being an endosomal membrane, um, like being in an endosome and then being a small thing and then get um, cut out. And so this is like the cathepsin pathway, but um, because there's a thing called tempers two. So there's um, a different protease, which is not it, it just helps process the spike protein. So the spike protein binds and it has to undergo the shape shift and that requires um, cleavage by a protease, but not the protease. So don't confuse it with the protease we're talking about. We're talking about human protease here. That's like on the cell surface and it's going to help activate the protein to get inside. But it has to latch on first. So um, antibody-based drugs like the cocktails, like a general cocktail and that sort of thing, they can work by blocking the virus from getting into cells. Um, but so once the virus is in the cells, what it has to do is, so it's a positive stranded virus. So basically it has its instructions ready to go. Um, and so once it's in, it can start using them to get the cellular machinery. So like the cellular ribosomes to start making viral proteins. Um, and it makes it as this long polyprotein that it then uses proteases to chop up into individual proteins. And so this is where the protease inhibitor we're talking about is coming in. It's going to work to prevent the processing of these. Um, and so basically within that like strand of RNA that the virus has, it has um, these various, um, various like genes, various proteins. So it has this like, the ones like the structural proteins, so like the spike proteins and nucleocapsid um, envelope membrane, these proteins, are, um, they have their own genes and are made as individual proteins. But most of the rest of them are made as this single um, replicase gene for making numerous non-structural proteins or NSPs. And these include the RNA dependent RNA polymerase, as well as various um, things that'll do things like um, inhibit the immune system from um, like killing the virus and stuff. And so then the ribosome is going to follow the instructions and it can actually like frame shift. Um, so it can stop, it replicate, it can translate just like 1A to get polyprotein 1A or all, go all the way to get um, 1B. Um, so it can make these various products depending on um, like whether it slips or not, um, which it can help control. Um, but then basically either way, the, it uses these, um, it's proteases to cut them apart into the individual ones. And so you can see it's actually pretty cool. They cut themselves out. So there's these two proteases. There's this PL pro, uh, papain like protease, and then this M pro, um, sometimes called 3CL because it's like a chemotrypsin like protease. 
So a protease or a peptidase is just a protein cutter. And so they can vary based on where they cut and like how they cut. Um, so MPRO is a cysteine protease. So it gets its scissors, its blades from the amino acid cysteine. Um, so basically proteins are long chains of amino acid letters and they have these different properties um, that allow them to do different things. And cysteine is one of these amino acids and it has this um, thiol group, this SH, that's going to, that can get activated to attack. Um, and so we're gonna see it attack. And when you have attack, you can, it, um, so peptidases, so this is for serine protease, um, but it's a similar mechanism with the cysteine protease. So serine has this OH, cysteine has this SH. Um, so it has sulfur instead of oxygen. Um, so with the cysteine protease, you just have like a dyad. So serine working with histidine and this aspartate's not, it's not part of like, like a triad. Um, so just ignore like the aspartate for here. But the basic idea is that <clears throat> the cysteine is going to activate the serine by taking a proton. Um, don't worry about the details for now. I'll draw out a mechanism for you in a little bit, um, but I don't want to bore everyone with all the details if they're not interested. Um, then that serine is going to attack, and this is going to get part. This is going to get part of this stuck on here, and then you have this covalent intermediate where part of the substrate is stuck on tight. So the substrate is the thing that it's going to act on. So in this case, um, so it would be like the peptide, the polypeptide that it's cutting up. So part of it would be stuck on, but then water is going to help kick it off. Um, with this um, drug, what's going to happen is instead of having your protein be stuck here, the drug is going to be stuck on here. So you're going to get, it's going to kind of like mimic this. Um, it's gonna mimic the peptide and then it's gonna get stuck on. And it's gonna get stuck on more stably than the, um, the peptide would. So it's not gonna like, it can't get hydrolyzed off as easily. It's not, um, it, is it is reversible, um, but it's a very strong, it's hard to reverse type of thing. Um, so it's not like it's just like falling easily off, but this reaction on this binding is reversible. It's, it can come on and off. You're not actually kicking off part of the drug, you're just getting it stuck because it's like addict. Um, and so that's the basic idea with the inhibitor is that we're going to get it stuck in the active site. Um, and so basically, we, if we look at MPRO, so it's actually really pretty. Um, it looks like a heart. So this is a different, um, this is a different inhibitor that's bound. But so MPRO basically it's a homodimer. So there's two copies of a single protomer. Um, so a protomer is a single subunit and it has these various parts. But what we care about here is this active site. Um, and so the idea is that you, so you can see here, you have that histidine, which is going to activate the cysteine. Um, and then you have the cysteine. And so this is the active site where things are going to happen. And the um, inhibitor is going to bind there and prevent that. Um, so more on how they find this inhibitor in a minute, but the structure of the inhibitor is something like this or it is this. Um, and so you can see that you kind of like mimic this peptide backbone. So it looks kind of like a peptide, but here you have, instead of a C double bond O, you have a C triple bond N. So this nitrile group, um, and this is going to act as a warhead to get it stuck on to the enzyme. And so basically here's the structure and the paper. Um, so you can see it fits nicely into this pocket, but then the it's going to, if you look at it from a different angle, you can see that it forms this thioimidate addict. Um, so an imide is a C double bond N. So you have a C double bond N now and a thio. So it's like um, a sulfur, um, sulfur addict. Um, and so that's the paper um, version, but it helps to look at it in like 3D. So 
but yeah, so I've colored it so that you can see things better, but you can see you have these like two protomers and then here is the drug actually bound. So if you like click on it, you can get a zoom in and you can see all the interactions that it's making. So there's that um, cysteine 145, that's the catalytic cysteine and it's forming this adduct. Um, and then you can see that it, it has, it's fitting nicely into this um, pocket. So if I put the surface mode on, um, you can see that, whoopsie, I need a mouse. Um, you can see that it's fitting nicely into this pocket that's created and it's making um, that addict. So it's actually sticking on there. Um, so I encourage you to play around. Um, so 7SI9 is the PDB number and I can put a link. Okay, but let's go back to how they actually found this. Okay, so now I'm going to be talking about that paper that I mentioned. Um, and so going back to their starting point and their end point and what kind of these various values mean. Um, so this is just showing you the chemical structure. Um, and so to make, you can see that they made these various changes and along the way they're changing these different parameters. Um, because it's kind of hard to see them all, like to compare, I just want to, I'm just going to show the start and the end point um, to try to explain some of these things. Um, so basically this, the Ki is like the inhibitory um, like how much do you need in order to inhibit half of it? Um, and so for these experiments, what they're doing, this is done with like a FRET assay. Um, I've talked about FRET in the past, for example, when I was talking about the, um, so I'm just looking for that slide. When I was talking about the like, the PCR tests and that sort of thing. They use this quench fluorescent substrate. So basically on fluorescence is where one molecule absorbs, so a molecule absorbs wavelength, one wavelength and then gives off um, light of a different wavelength. And if you have something called FRET, instead of, so light is basically energy waves. Um, and so instead of being given off as light, if you have like, this floor, your fluorophore and a quencher that are like matched. Um, the quencher, so it's just like a chemical group that's matched to this fluorophore. So this, um, another chemical group. And so in these substrates, um, so basically these like short peptides that have sequences that the proteas will like to cut. Um, and they can put a fluorophore on one end and a quencher on the other end. And this way, when the fluorophore tries to give off light, instead it's what it's going to do is it's just going to transfer its energy to the quencher. So if you shine light of one wavelength on it, the fluorophore is going to absorb it. But then instead of giving it back as light, it's going to pass the energy to the quencher. And so you won't see light giving, given off. But if the protease cuts it, then you'll see light. Um, and so this will enable them to do like rapid screening and stuff to see if they're inhibiting the enzyme. So, and how much they need to add to inhibit the enzyme. Um, and so that's where you can get this Ki. So the bigger the number, the more you need to add in order to inhibit half of the enzyme or like to reduce the activity by half. Um, so that's what the Ki is. And so you can see that this is slightly higher for um, their final compound, but not too significantly, um, especially compared to some of the other um, values you'll see that were a lot worse. Like this one was like 230 um, nanomoles and nanomoles is just a measure of concentration. Um, so then they also wanted to see other things like, okay, so we know it inhibits this protease in these like fret assays where we're just mixing components like purified components in some, in like a tube. Um, but will it actually work in cells? And so, so they want to test if it would work in cells. And so here they're testing for like cytopathic effect. Um, so does it make the cells uh, sick and how much you need to add to make the cells sick? Um, and so you can see this is actually slightly more active than the original one in this assay, um, this experiment or this measurement. Oh yeah, so I wasn't really sure what the cytopathic effect assay was, um, but it looks like they were monitoring cell viability 
Um, so basically seeing, um, using this luminescent cell viability assay that determines the number of viable cells based on the quantification of ATP present. Um, so they were looking basically to see if the cells were, how many of this, what proportion of the cells were alive, if I'm understanding that correctly. Yeah, sorry, this, I'm not used to virology assays. They tested other things with bioavailability. Um, so I'm not familiar with all of these various things. Um, so oral F, this is like the measured dose after oral divided, like compared to, so like divided by the intravenous administration. So you can see that you only get like 1.4% of it, um, of the active drug when you give this old, this um, initial one um, orally instead of intravenously, but you get like 50% of it if with the newer one. So it has a much better like bioavailability. And then this is the fraction absorbed by the gastrointestinal tract. And so you can see that it's much, much better um, for the newer one, barely any, if you were to try to give the other one orally. So they tested a range of effects. Um, so basically, so they tested with different cell types, um, things like viral titer. So how much of the virus was there? Um, viral replication, um, cell viability and like how much they needed to add. So EC50 is to like cause 50% inhibition of, or 50% of um, the cells to experience this CPE or whatever, so cytopathic effect. Um, 90 would be 90% of them. So you'll always have a higher amount needed to get to 90 than to 50. Um, in terms of interpreting these curves, so basically the more you need to add to get the effect, the higher you're going to shift to the right. And then these curves, what they're doing is they're comparing the activity of the um, enzyme against the SARS-CoV-2 compared to the other um, to other coronaviruses. Um, and so you can see that SARS-CoV-2 is the farthest to the left. Um, so you have to add less of it than you need to add to the other cells in order to have an effect. But you um, next you see um, SARS-CoV-1. Um, and so basically you see some activity against other coronaviruses, but not as, as good of activity. Um, yeah, so here it's just looking at like percent velocity. So like, how well it's inhibiting the drug and like those assays um, and then the viral induced cytopathic effects. Um, so is there like the cell-based assays? Um, is it killing the cells? So this is how they know that it's still reversible. Um, so basically this compound seven is like their control. It's uh, they know that this one is irreversible. Um, this is the compound that we're talking about that's in the drug, and this is no compound added, just MPRO alone, and this is fractional velocity, so they're talking about um, like how much it's inhibited um, in their FRET assay compared to not having added anything. That's at least my interpretation of what it is. Um, and so this, what they did was they took this and they diluted it like a hundredfold. Um, so they they incubated the drug with the MPRO, so let it inactivate it, um, and then they diluted it a hundredfold, and then measured the active relative activity to what it was before they um, before they diluted it, and so that gives you the fractional velocity. Um, that's at least how I um, interpreted the um, the methods. Um, and so you can see that when they dilute it, they are able to rescue some of the activity of the enzyme, telling you that it is reversible, um, but it's not like easily reversible. So it's um, stronger than just like a normal competitive inhibitor um, where it just kind of like competes for the active site um, because it's actually getting stuck on there and not just competing with like weak um, interactions. Um, so, it's selective or, or so it has some activity against other coronaviruses as we showed in that other chart. So this is just another way of um, showing it. So this is just inhibiting 
Um, so this is the front assay, um, various coronaviruses. So you can see that some of them like CoV-1, it can inhibit uh, that protease fairly well, also has um, moderate activity against a couple of the others, some not so much. Um, but it has very, um, it doesn't inhibit unrelated proteases. Um, and um, so you can see that these have IC50s of um, over 100. So like this is like the inhibitory dose for 50, um, for like 50, 50%. Um, um, and so you can see that it's in the um, high micromolars greater than 100. So here we're talking about like nanomolars. And here we're talking about micromolar, um, which is like a thousand fold larger. Um, so way more than, and they can't, I'm guessing that this is like, can't even be measured with their test is basically what it's saying is that there's no inhibition of those other things, which is good. So all that's really promising, but why is there this like weird, like HIV drug or whatever in it? So Paxlovid, so like Pfizer's um, drug or whatever. I'm not sure if Paxlovid is just this part, like means just this part or means the combination of the two. But anyway, what they're trying to get authorization for is this, P, this PFF thing that we've been talking about as well as with, in combination with ritonavir. And so ritonavir is an inhibitor of CYP. Um, so basically these are these um, cytochrome protein. I don't know what, I don't, can't remember what the acronym stands for. CYP stands for cytochrome P450. Um, but basically they're modifying the drug and they know that this is modifying the drug. So if they take their drug, um, so I basically had no idea what this HLM thing was, but it's like a humor, human liver uh, microsome. Um, and it's a subcellular fraction of um, the liver, which contains membrane bound drug metabolizing enzymes. Um, so basically this is where those modifying things are. And so instead of having to make the, um, the products, like instead of having to use animals to see how they'll metabolize the product or that sort of thing, you can measure how these are being modified, um, in human cells, um, by, well, not using cells, but using the, just like the portions of the cells that contain um, those enzymes. Then they look at the properties of it and see how it's been modified. Um, and so this is when they were doing it in these, um, so this is when they were doing it in like these hepatocytes, um, so like liver cells. And this is when it was done with recombinant protein. So basically they expressed and purified the pure CYP3A4 um, enzyme. So one of those modifying, and they see that they get the same, the same signal. And so this is a UV absorbance after um, HPLC. So high performance liquid chromatography. And basically, so they're separating based on um, some property of the things um, so they can separate them and then they're going to further analyze, they further analyze them with like NMR. Um, so you can find all that stuff in the supplemental, which is where most of the cool figures are that I'm showing. Um, but basically the, the key thing is that they see the same profile. Um, and so they're getting these various metabolites. So these modified versions, um, so you can see they have like these OH groups added, um, which is what SIPs like to do. Um, and this is going to, um, this aids in the clearance of the drug. So how well you're like, how quickly your body actually gets rid of them. Um, and they were able to further show that it was SIP3A4 metabolizing it, um, or at least uh, or four or five because they added um, an inhibitor for four that inhibits four and five. Um, so it's inhibitor ketoconazole, which I'm guessing is similar to raponavir. Um, but so or maybe it's a brand name. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, so it needs the cofactor NADH. So it's like helper molecule. So they should, 
So basically they can either inhibit the thing by not giving it its cofactor or by adding the inhibitor. I um, mean, either way, what you're looking at is, so the T one half, so that's like the half-life of the compound. Um, and then CL int, um, I'm not exactly sure. Oh, intrinsic clearance, okay. Intrinsic clearance, so like how well it's being cleared. Um, and so you can see that if you have, if you don't give it the cofactor, it has a long half-life. The drug has a long half-life, so it's lasting a long time. But if you don't um, give, if you give it the cofactor, then this drug only has a half-life of like 28.2 minutes in this assay. And there's like humor liver microsomal um, stability assay. Um, and so this half-life is so half is like how long half of it lasts. Um, so it'll take in the in one half-life from the beginning, you'll have half of it left, and then one half-life after that, you'll have half of that left, and then half of that left, and half of that left. Um, and so the half-life, if you have a shorter half-life that's less um less um, stable, less and more quickly um, cleared. Um, if you have a longer half-life, then it's lasting longer. Um, so you can see that if you add the inhibitor, um, then you get a longer half-life of the drug. And so this is why they add the drug to slow down the breakdown. And now um, let's go into that geeky mechanism. And then I'll let you guys go. Well, actually, I'm not keeping you here, but if you're here, then I'm hoping that means that this was helpful for you. And yes, sorry, I didn't know what some of those terms meant. So in the active site, you have something like this. So I'm not drawing it all out, but you have a histidine with this nitrogen as part of um, that imidazole ring. Um, you have cysteine with the thiol, so this SH group. Um, so this SH, so this cysteine is going to be the catalytic one. Um, and so it's going to be driving the reaction, but it's not very reactive right now. Um, so what happens is this histidine is going to activate it. So it can act as a base and kind of like steal this hydrogen. And this now leads you with um, a much more reactive thiolate. So this is um, like a negatively charged intermediate um, that is now much more reactive. Um, and so now the histidine's done its job so we can focus on this cysteine and what the cysteine is going to do is typically like so like in a peptide what it's going to do is it's highly what we call nucleophilic so basically it has more electrons than it wants and so it's going to attack something that wants electrons and has fewer electrons than it wants and so it's going to attack an electrophile and it'll find one with this carbon. So this oxygen is pulling electrons away. This oxygen is partly negative. This is partly positive, And this is going to be our electrophile. What's going to happen is this can attack. And then um, it will push this group off as a leaving group. And you've cut your peptide. Um, at this point, it's stuck on there. And then water comes and cleaves them off. So that's what normally happens with a peptide substrate, but what happens with um, this inhibitor? So basically the inhibitor, so the backbone of the inhibitor kind of looks like a peptide backbone, but it has this nitrile group and it's gonna kind of confuse the um, confuse the enzyme. So this, um, this, so this nitrile group, so in the picture it looks like this, and if we draw that out, we can see it's actually, so it's a carbon triple bonded to a nitrogen, and we call this a nitrile group. Um, so similarly to this carbon, this carbon is going to be electrophilic. Um, sorry, I'm trying to write on the edge of the page. But um, so this carbon is going to be having its electrons withdrawn by this nitrogen group and the triple bonds. And so this is going to be electrophilic. So the cysteine, instead of attacking a peptide, is going to attack this carbon. This is going to push this to here. What's going you're going to get is you have your carbon, your nitrogen, 
Um, this is now going to have um, this part now is going to be attached to the cyst to the sulfur of the cysteine. So now you have this intermediate where you're attached to the cysteine. Um, and now you can then have this um, histidine then can, um, this nitrogen can take the histidine. So you end up with something like this. Sorry, my pencil is not cooperating. You end up with something like this, where you have this with the rest of the enzyme. So this is all the enzyme, and this was where your drug was. Um, and so now this is attached to the nitrogen. Nitrogen's happy now. Um, all's good. The um, histidine is reset, but now you have this stuck on your enzyme. Um, and so it's inhibiting the enzyme for now. Um, so they show that this is reversible though. So this is covalent. So they're like sharing electrons, but it's not as strong as, um, it's not like, it's not permanent. Um, so if you can dilute it out, if you, um, so they show you can like dilute it out. Um, so this can break apart. Um, but for now it's stuck on. So the reaction, like it, this reaction is, um, it's reversible, but it's mostly in the forward direction. Um, and so you're going to get most of it being added and less of it being broken. Um, and so then you have a uh, fairly stable inhibition.